So um, Agent of Change is, is a, a, a name that was used really from the, the very first start, from that first charrette that Brian mentioned, as, as a way of describing the, the very ethos behind this building. I think um, partly because the real name for the building is just so long, no, nobody could be bothered to say the full thing. So Agent of Change. Um, the concept behind the building is, is to be a, a teaching tool for the sustainable trades in, in the construction industry. So in order to do so, we, we needed a, a building that was going to be really at the, the, at the forefront of sustainable construction. And if we're going to do that and, and, and target those, those goals, we needed some sort of measurable benchmark that we could test ourselves all the way through. Otherwise, the first challenge, we would compromise and, and, you know, and sort of drop back. So, so that benchmark, we, we chose the Living Building Challenge. The Living Building Challenge was developed in the Pacific Northwest. It's, it's viewed as probably the highest benchmark in the sustainable industry. And it's, um, it's based on, on a, a number of very high standards. Um, I, I won't go into all of it, but net zero energy uh, generated from renewable sources on site, net zero water use, um, a, a long list of um, prohibited materials to, to avoid those toxic materials that Brenda referred to. Um, but going beyond that, using local materials to create a building that's, that's of its place, that's designed for the Penticton climate, and also one that really puts well-being at, at, at the forefront. So um, I really wish those people who are joining us online could be here, because we could go through and you could see a lot of the different um, aspects in, in first hand. But in, in this talk, I'm going to try and cover just a, a few of those uh, and pick off some of the salient points. We're going to start with materials. Um, materials, we, we have a, a long list of, of red list materials that we've talked about, including heavy materials, uh, heavy metals, uh, PVC, wood preservatives. Um, I, I'm not going to go into all of them. We don't have time to dive into that. Um, but just fair to say that these materials are, are actually ubiquitous throughout the, the construction industry. And this was, was the first major challenge for this project. Alongside that is, is the need for local materials. Um, so depending on the density of the material, we were confined by these concentric rings. So as take, for instance, brick or, or concrete, which is a, a dense, heavy material, that had to be sourced and manufactured within 500 kilometers of the site. And then the, the raw materials for that production had to be within 500 kilometers of the point of manufacture. If we, if we look at the same again, but this time superimpose that on a population map, as they say in the industry, there's your problem. Um, it, we're looking at the first three rings that is the majority of our materials. Almost half of that is the Pacific Ocean. One third of it is the Great White North. Most of the manufacturing belt on the eastern seaboard is, is outside of our circles. You know, the, the rest of it is, is largely prairies and, and agricultural belt. So we're limited to the, uh, the, the West Coast, the majority of our materials. Yep. Yeah. But if, if we're really going to have a building that's of its place, as, as Brenda has touched on, we can't afford to ignore this. Pine beetle kill. A lot of you are familiar with it. Uh, a little beetle that's spreading unchecked due to mild winters, introducing a, a fungal infection into the tree, which kills the tree, turning it to this, this red color. And if the tree isn't harvested and used for lumber within three to four years, the structural benefit of that tree is, is lost. And, and ultimately, it's, it's probably going to burn if it goes up in, in flames in a, in a forest fire. And in so doing, it's, it's releasing that carbon dioxide that's been sequestered over decades back into the atmosphere. So the college and everyone involved really recognized that we had to address this as, as part of the design solution. So the decision was made to, to go to a timber frame construction throughout and use local wood materials. So there was our, our first action as this building as an agent of change was to actually challenge this sustainable industry as, as a whole where the preconception that is that all wood has to be FSC certified. We had to challenge that and come up with this series of parameters to use pine beetle kill wood. And we negotiated those with the Living Building Institute. The next one is the indoor environment. And, and part of the, again, part of the agent of change is, is giving back control of, of the working environment to the individuals. So um, all the individuals, all workspaces have to be in, in close proximity to windows. 
for, for daylight and, and views out, and, and opening windows so you can have controlled natural ventilation. In spaces such as, as in here, in the workshop, we have high clear story windows to throw light further into the deep planned spaces. Um, and in the workshops, we also use clear story windows on the, on the east side to use that early morning sun to uh, preheat these spaces in the winter and, and warm the spaces up. But then the same, same windows have a large overhanging roof. So in the summer months, those windows are shaded so you don't get overheating in the summer. Um, in, in the human kinetics uh, and the, the innovation center, uh, we we're prototyping a new technology that's actually tracking the sun. This, and th the way this works is a series, an array of hundreds of little small mirrors which tr actively track the sun through the course of the day on the, on the south elevation. Those mirrors then redirect the sunlight, focus it, and then concentrate it. And it's, it's sent through a highly reflective duct through the building and distributing that sunlight evenly throughout the space. Um, ventilation, um, on a hot, warm day like today, we have the windows open and the, the natural cool air comes in through the space that that air is kept cool by radiant pipes within the floor slab and we're using the natural temperature of the groundwater to keep the slab cool and keep the air cool and bring it deep into the space. Then that cool air then meets warm bodies like a, a TEDx audience and you get a, a, a column of fresh air rising around each individual and that warm air can then rise and accumulate up at high level within the spaces. Now in, in winter that, that tall space can be used to, to stratify the air and we can take out the heat from that space through high efficiency heat exchangers. Um, but in summer, we, have, we allow that natural buoyancy to go up through chimneys. And there's a series of chimneys going along the length of the building. And that, that vents the air out through and uses the stack effect, and then thereby drawing in more air into the building. Um, we, we further enhance that with um, glazed screens on the front of these chimneys. We use solar gain into the, the base of the chimney to, to boost the stack effect. Uh, within those spaces and thereby draw more air in on those uh, hot, sticky days that we get in the Penticton. So energy, that's uh, you know, with everyone's interest in terms of CO2 emissions and, and, and peak oil, uh, there's obviously a keen interest in how this building is targeting net zero energy. And I, I want to address that in, in three ways, in a three-stage process, um, conserve, capture and create. So the first stage, conserve, um, having a highly efficient, um, cons sorry, conserving the energy used within the building and reducing the, the, the loads is a very obvious and very logical solution, which is actually extremely cost effective. So we have a very highly efficient uh, building envelope. So we use high thicknesses of insulation. We use triple glazed windows with argon filled cavities. Um, and we have a very airtight construction as well. Um, on top of that, we reduce the number of external doors, and in all the main routes, we have uh, vestibules to, to stop drafts. In the capture, when we, when we go on to capturing the, the free energy that's about, the, the free solar energy and, and natural ventilation, we talked about natural ventilation already and, and the early morning preheat. In the public spaces that you came through coming in here, we're using that with, with a lot of glazing on the south elevation. Uh, and that's so that in, in the winter, this will work. Yeah, oops, sorry. in the winter we have this low angle sun, which comes in preheating this space, and we can use that captured heat and distribute it throughout the building. But in the summer, those you know, like today when we're close to the summer equinox, we have the, these louvers on the south face, which actually shade that and stop any solar gain in the summer, so you're not overheating in the summer months. Um, the one other part of, of capture. Um, is, is the geothermal source uh, for the, the groundwater heat pump. Now, I think a lot of people are very familiar with that technology. It's well recognized, so I'm not going to dive into that. But that's making use of the, of the free energy of the, the ambient temperature of the groundwater. So between those very well recognized and, and simple, well tested principles of conserve and capture, we can actually reduce the energy load for the whole building by 75% compared to a conventional building. And that's, that's where, the, you know, where the target's achieved in, in those first two. It's only then, once you've reduced it, can we consider create, the, the, the third part. How do we create energy from renewable sources um, on site? Now, in, in Penticton, so solar energy is, is an obvious choice. It's a very good fit. Um, unfortunately, for the, for the college, solar hot water 
um, isn't as good a fit because the majority of the, the creation of solar hot water occurs during the summer months when the demand is at its least. Uh, but on the other hand, solar PV is, is, is a very good match. Uh, through a, a net metering agreement with, with the city, uh, when we're generating PV and there's an excess, that can be exported back onto the grid. And that, that excess can be drawn on in, in the winter months or, or at night when we're not generating en energy, and thereby targeting net zero over the year. So w w our, our first phase of the array is, is 260 kilowatts array. We believe that's the largest array in Western Canada, and that's going to be generating about 300 kilowatt hours per annum. Coming on to beauty, which is another part of the challenge, um, very early on in the process we had a, a conversation uh, with Jeanette Armstrong, who's one of today's other guest speakers. Um, and in that conversation, she, she, she was talking about the, yeah, here we go, the, um, the winter homes of the Inokwin people, the, the, the Quincy, um, and how there was a lot of similarities in terms of passive design um, with what we're trying to do. Uh, the Quincy would be located on a south-facing slope to capture that early spring sun to warm the building. Um, it'd also be re recessed into the ground to use the thermal mass of the ground. And you also have, of course, natural ventilation with the opening over the fire pit. But our, our conversation went on, and um, she started talking about the, some of the values of the Silex Nation and, and how the, the four columns in the center of the Quincy represented a, a fulcrum, um, a, a balance between opposites. So if you have change and tradition, uh, action and reaction, or, or any form of opposite. And if, if there was an imbalance, you, you would try and come back to a balance in the middle of the Quincy. Um, I'm sure Jeanette can describe it far more eloquently than I do, but we were thinking that analogy could apply to this building. Um, as an agent to change, we're, we're trying to readdress the, the imbalance of our dependency on fossil fuels over the last century and, and, and create a new balance between passive design and a new innovative technologies, some of which I've, I've tried to describe. So uh, as an agent of change, um, the, bu the building is now nearing com or complete and the first users are moving in. But the challenge really is far from complete. In many ways, the challenge is only just beginning for the, for the users. Um, so looking back at the process, I think what's been most noticeable for us as, as a design team is that, that pro the, the, the targets have been achieved not by one individual or one single champion, but through genuine teamwork between the three different elements, the, the, the college, the design team, and the, and the contractors. And moreover, within each of those teams, um, there's been a genuine commitment and cooperation with, with every individual involved. The, the, the project really initiated from a, a groundswell of, of various sustainable initiatives at all levels within the college. And this was recognized by the different levels of government and, and that the project was born. And I think I should also add that the college should be commended for their, their willingness to um, consider and, and take on the risks involved in such a, such a project. We, we talked about the initial charrette when all the, all the stakeholders involved were brought together in that initial charrette. And what was noticeable for us for a radical building, what was most noticeable it was within that group there were very few, if any, naysayers, which is very unusual. I, I think, simply put, everybody got it. Um, moving on to the design team, uh, for us it was a, a very exciting and, and dynamic process being part of that design team that, that Brenda referred to. Um, lots of ideas being bounced around and challenging uh, and cooperative working, you're testing uh, different ideas. Okay. Um, one of which I, I want to sort of consider here is, is the solution in the gym. We were sort of challenged because you can't use radiant heating or cooling within the gym um, because of the timber floor. So we came up with these composite panels whereby the radiant heating is encased within the concrete element, a very thin concrete element, which is held between glue lamb beams. And because of the structural action between the glue lamb beams and the concrete, which we believe is a, a first for North America, um, we could reduce that concrete down to 75 millimeters. Now these panels are 10 meters high. If, if that was a precast panel, that would be at least twice that thick. So we're, we're saving concrete, we're reducing weight, and uh, reducing the embodied carbon. The, the third part of the team is, is the constructors, or the contractors, who have been involved in the process throughout, and they've been implementing um, the, 
implementing the, the, the challenges on site and sourcing those new materials and new technologies. Um, and I think in, in doing so, they're actually starting that process as, as an agent of change and starting to affect sort of quite often cynical attitudes within the construction industry. Um, so they're, thereby, they're, they're starting the process that the college building hopes to, uh, to complete. So, so to conclude, that very finally, um, as individuals, we each do our part for sustainability, uh, whether it's composting or, or, or cycling, recycling, etc. In the construction industry, we're privileged to, to work on green buildings uh, and make a, a bigger impact. But I think it's not that. That's not the inspiration and motivation for everyone involved in the different parts of the team. It's, is that um, this building, even though it is very radical and a green building, it's the fact that it's going to be used as a teaching tool for the construction industry, and thereby it's going to influence the next generation of construction workers throughout the Okanagan and, and British Columbia and, and beyond. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Thanks.